look, there's heaps that I could say. I'll try not to say it for too long, and I'll certainly try not to say it boringly. But when I was the bishop in uh, Bathurst Diocese, I became known as Bookmark Bishop. And every sermon that I gave, I had a bookmark for. And all around the diocese, people got these bookmarks. So I've done you a bookmark as well today. And I put at the top the question mark, how then shall we live? I'm here today as a sort of bridge or an interim between the sermons that you've been doing on Nehemiah and Ezra and the, all these things that you're going to do left and right and later on in the year you're going to be looking at Colossians. So I'm a sort of bridge between the two. And Paul is speaking to people who were in a very difficult situation, just like we are today. He was speaking from his own difficult situation. We're not quite sure where he, we're not sure where he was when he wrote to the Colossians. I think he was in Ephesus, which was about as far away from Colossae as Melbourne is from here. And uh, he had never visited Colossae. Epaphras had been there. Epaphras had become a Christian and gone to Colossae from Ephesus and preached the gospel there. And he'd come back, reported to Paul. In the meantime, there'd been a whole heap of angst for Paul because he had been the victim of a concerted campaign to discredit him and he had ended up in prison and prison is not like what we have if you didn't have friends who brought you food you didn't get any if you didn't uh, ha pay the jailer very much money you had squalid conditions he was also going through a time of great anxiety he this was not how he had imagined preaching the gospel would be like and then it, otherwise, and then there is a guy who's come to see him. He's called Onesimus. And as Onesimus hears the Christian faith and becomes a Christian, Paul realizes that Onesimus is a slave who's run away from his master. And his master is a Christian back in Colossae. And somehow he's got to get these two people back together. So he writes a letter to the Colossians and he writes a letter to Philemon and he sends them with Onesimus and a couple of other folks to go back there and praying like mad that it'll get sorted out. Meantime, Paul in prison is still dealing with the trauma that he has experienced of being the victim of a concerted campaign against him. So it's not an easy situation for him at all. So we come also in our own situation here today. We come in a, in a world in which this week seven football players have stood up for their culture and for their faith at great cost to themselves. We're living in a, in a culture which does not see the damage that he's doing. I'm grateful for Tim Costello. That's not Peter Costello who was the treasurer of, uh, uh, of Australia, but uh, Tim Costello is his brother, was the head of World Vision, now doing a lot of work with re gambling relief and also with um, refugees and things like that. Great Christian leader. And Tim Costello pointed out, he said, you know, Des Hasler was sat there saying, we don't want to harm people. We want, you know, everybody to be right and everything like that and so on. And, uh, yeah, um, sitting there with advertising power bet right the way across the front of his jersey. If you read the Geelong advertiser yesterday, you would have read that $105 million has been lost by people in Geelong alone in 2021 on gambling. Gambling is harming people. And uh, Des Hasler was sat there saying, we don't want to harm people. That's why we're putting the rainbow on it and all those sorts of things. And yet he's advertising one of the 
big, big things that harm people. But I hope that one of the things that comes out of that whole um, experience this week is, as Tim Costello also said, that people begin to realize that actually being a multicultural society does mean to say that we've got to take on the religious and cultural beliefs of other people and stand and understand them. Where am I going in all of this? If you notice, I said, how then shall we live? As the title of uh, the question that I've got. We live in a context, that is the then. I deliberately picked it from uh, a, a title of a book which uh, was written quite a bit of years ago by a great evangelical leader of the mid 20th century called Francis Schaeffer, an incredibly important guy, and he examines the philosophy of the of uh, the the uh, post-Christian of, of the Christian era, and he says we've been brought to the same place now where people have so discarded God that they have no foundation for how they live, and so we live with two things. We live with apathy and affluence. Oh, I only want a quiet life. Just give me a bit of peace. And that means to say, I'm not going to be involved. I'm going to take the easy road through everything. Apathy. And I just want to, you know, keep my own prosperity and I want to add to it and add to it and add to it. And he says, these things, because we have actually lost the foundation for our living, are going to lead us into all sorts of different, uh, uh, of difficult situations. One of the things that he argued very strongly was that we will be people who give up making decisions and therefore we will be led by people who dictate how we should live. One of the things that I found absolutely fascinating about the incident that I've just talked about this week is that actually I always thought that policy decisions were made by the board of a company and not by the CEO. That was what I've been taught. I always thought that in controversial things were done with consultation before being imposed upon people. That's not what happened. That's not what happened. But we do live in a difficult time. One of the things which might have gone under the radar for many of us was that the CSIRO released this week their 10-year plan or their 10-year sort of notes about the things that are going to be really important for us in the coming decade. Um, they do it every 10 years. And it comes out and they highlighted a whole heap of them. They highlighted a lot of things that are going to be the context in which we're going to be talking about things. And uh, they put it like this, if I, can, if I can actually read my notes without them all going away. Here we are. Oh, shouldn't have so many things, should I? <laughs> now the Bible, now I've lost the place in the Bible now as well. Never mind, can't do that. The director of the CSIRO, Larry, Executive uh, Dr. Larry Marshall, said, Australia is at a pivotal point. There's a tidal wave of disruption on the way, and it's critical that we take steps now to get ahead of it. We've got to adapt to climate change. We've got to deal with the effects of weather, of natural disasters. We've got to learn to how to be cleaner and greener, how to live with new technologies and digital economy, how to deal with the effects of new unknown illnesses, the difficulties of an aging population, how we might handle diversity in society and shifts in global economies. Uncertain, pivotal, it's great. As I said, I'm here. You've been looking at Nehemiah, you've been looking at Ezra and they were looking at a very difficult time in their history. 
They came back from exile. They knew they had gone into exile because of their sin. How then do we live, they were saying, in their new situation, back in Jerusalem, building walls? Yeah, that's one thing. But how do you live as a people? And it gave rise to the synagogues. It gave rise to the Pharisees. It gave rise to other small groups saying, how do we live? But there is another side to all of that that, was, that you're going on to. You're going on to think about, how, about these issues. And so I wanted to be a sort of bridge <laughs> between the two. Because in Colossians chapter 1, Paul gives us some very good information about how we shall live. I shall discard all my notes because I'm not going to get anywhere with those. I shall bring out the Bible reading so that I've got that in front of me. Yes, here we are, because I need that. And I will direct you to the other side of the then how shall we live, the context. Because Paul is absolutely clear about the context in which he was facing all these difficulties. The context is that Jesus Christ has lived, died, and God has raised him from the dead. That is the context for the Christian people. That is the context not only for Christian people, but one of the remarkable things that Paul says in this passage is it's the context for the whole world. The early Christians had a very clear understanding about Jesus' resurrection. It wasn't what we often talk about today. Oh, you're going to be all right. You're going to be at peace. You know, someone who's passed away, they have gotten to be at peace. You know, everything's all right. No, it was something quite different. Paul puts this very, very clearly. But I need to take a step back, first of all. In this passage in Colossians, Paul gives a lot of things that are really important. He has this poem right in the middle from verses 15 to 21. He has a poem. In Jesus, God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. In verse 24, he or verse 22, he continues, But now you, he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you wholly before him by Christ's physical body. He is saying very clearly here that what has happened is that God has become incarnate in the flesh in Jesus. Absolutely clear. Understand, this was a man who had gone through the first part of his life saying, there is only one God. And that God is distant, that God is in charge, that God is all-powerful. But he came to see that in Jesus, God had been made known. He came to see that if you want to know who God is and what God is like, you look at Jesus Christ. If I'm walking along, if, if someone is in another room, I can't actually see them. I'm sitting in my chair. My wife is in another room over there. I can't actually see her. If there's a mirror on the wall, I might be able to see the mirror and see her in the mirror. What Paul is saying is that Jesus is the mirror image of God. If we want to know what God is like, we can see him in the mirror. We can't see God directly, but we can see Jesus. And what Jesus has done is to come and show the compassion that God has for the whole of the world. The compassion that he has not only for individuals, but for the whole of the cosmos. God so loved the world. Quite rightly, we say, God so loved me, God so loved you, but we need to remember that God loves the whole world. 
And I believe that that means not only all the people in the world, but actually the world itself. Don't know about you, but when I was at school um, and I did a piece of work, I used to get frequently seven or eight out of ten. And you would get, if you got seven out of ten, the teacher would write satisfactory at the bottom. If I got eight out of ten, the teacher would write good. Well, if I got nine out of ten, the teacher would write very good, and ten out of ten, the teacher would write excellent. Well, if you read the book of Genesis, it says that God made the moon and the stars and all those sorts of things, and it was good. Was it eight out of ten? <laughs> no. <laughs> and when God made humanity, male and female, it says God made it very good. Was that nine out of ten? Well, sometimes I think it is nine out of ten. <laughs> But I don't believe that's what the Bible says at all. I think that God looked at the angels and says, that's marvelous, isn't it? Hey, didn't we do a great job? <laughs> I think God was thrilled with the creation. And do you think that the creation that God made and loves, that God was thrilled with, is going to end in a whimper? No, says St. Paul. By the resurrection from the dead, God has shown that he reigns, that he reigns in the person of his son over all and that he is supreme over everything. Firstborn, supreme, head, the one who has gone before. These are all words that Paul uses in his poem that he has in verses 15 to 21. This is the person that we're talking about. This is the context in which we're living we're living in a world where there is a lot of conflict, where it's not easy to stand up for our faith, but we're living in the world that God loves and over which God reigns. I think it's really important for, that to, for us to hear that. This is not a future tense, God will reign. In the resurrection of Jesus, the thing that was to happen at the end of the world has come into the middle of the world so that God has shown that he reigns. Resurrection is not to do with somebody being at peace. It is the triumph over death. The last words of which Paul uh, talks in verse 23, he says, This gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. Strange words. I didn't know that we'd managed to proclaim it to every creature under heaven. Did you? Uh, across the whole world? No, we have not managed to do that. What Paul is saying is actually something which is absolutely profound. I think he's saying this. He is saying that when Jesus died on the cross, when he proclaimed those words that John tells us, it is finished, tetelestai, it's done. Those words were proclaimed not only from the cross, they were proclaimed in the heavens and in hell. Satan is vanquished. God reigns. It is complete. And when he rose from the dead, that proclaimed to everybody that he is Lord. If you want to read more about it, go to 1 Peter chapter 3. It's a complicated bit there, but there's more about it there and in various other parts of the New Testament as well. Really important. We live in the context of a complicated world where it is not easy to be a Christian person, but we live because Jesus Christ lived, died, rose again, conquered death, and he is alive forevermore, and he reigns. I hold on to that. 
I hold on to that on a good day, and I try and hold on to it on bad days as well. So how, if that is the then, if that is the context, how should we live? I'm not asking you the question, what should I do? Or what would Jesus do? Good questions, yes. But those are questions about actions. If we ask the question, how should we live? We must look for answers that are bigger than that. And if you look at the bookmark, I've given you the answers. We need to look at our motivation. Jesus, we need to look at our empowerment. And we need to look at our life's outcomes as well. So we need to look at our motivation. One of the things that St. Paul talks about is Jesus being the head of the church. In one of these verses here, uh, verse 18, he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning. He is the firstborn from the dead. I hold on to that. It's really important. I know that matters of headship and being head are sensitive matters amongst many Christians. The New Testament, when it talks about Jesus as being the head, is saying something that is very multifaceted. Just have a think for a few minutes. Head, if you're in Lewis context and you've been in the military, you know what the headquarters is, you know what the head is, it's the place where the boss is, okay? That's not where, where it is in the Bible. First and foremost, headship is regard, headship is not used in the Bible, but the word head when it's used in the Bible is used in a very different way. So, um, the Jewish calendar, for instance, begins on New Year's Day. Rosh Hanunah means the head of the year. The word is, the be is therefore the beginning of the year. Not the most important, it's for the beginning. You talk about something else as well. We talk, for instance, about a head of steam in the old steam trains. If, you're a, if you go down the Bellarine and you go on the old steam engine down there, you have to get up a head of steam before the train can start. You've got to get the energy, the place. So head in English and in, uh, and in the uh, Hebrew as well, and, and, and in the Greek as well, becomes a place of energy. Not superiority, but the place that motivation comes from, that energy comes from. There's another sense of it as well, which we use in England, uh, when we talk about the head of a stream, the source of a stream. And we talk about energy, the head being the source of everything. When we talk about the head and the body, you know, it's no good just having a head, You've got to have a body as well, but the head controls the body, doesn't it? Not that it's more important, but that it is integrated into it so that it is part of it, so it's the controlling part of the body. Very, very many nuances. When Paul wants to talk about Christ being the leader, he words, uses words like first one like supreme over all. Head has many things, source, control, energy, as well as leadership. So Jesus is the head of the church. He is the one who is our motivation. He is the one from whom we get our energy. Hold on to that. And because he reigns. He reigns 
And because through faith in him, we have been, in the words of the hymn, and what Paul puts here, ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven. That's our motivation, all that we have been given through Christ. But there is an empowerment as well that Paul writes about here. He talks right at the beginning of this passage about the Spirit giving us wisdom and the knowledge of God. Knowledge is not something that we know about, it's something that we, somebody that we know intimately and we know well. When I was a kid, I'd read the Bible and it said, kept on saying in the book of Genesis, and Adam knew his wife and she conceived and bore a son and Seth conceived knew his wife and bore a son and Abraham knew Sarah and bore a son and I said to my dad um, what does why does it say he knew her and then and my dad coughed a bit and uh, <laughs> I had to go somewhere else to get the answer for it but where it's talking about there is not knowledge about somebody it's an intimate relationship with the person knowledge in the Bible when it's, it talks about the knowledge of God it doesn't talk about uh, I know God, uh, I know about God. He says, I know him intimately. And the wisdom of God which comes from it. So our empowerment is by the Spirit who gives us that intimate knowledge of God. And from that flows the way in which we should live. Understanding, knowledge, and the power that we need in order to be Christian people. Read this passage again and again and again and let the words just flow into you. The third thing that he, when we talk about how then shall we live, is that our life's outcomes are seen in our thinking, our actions, and our attitudes. This is what Paul is talking about. He says that we will be characterized by endurance. He says, it says, listen to what he says here. I'm praying for you, he says, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord, please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, and that you may have great endurance and patience, giving joyful thanks to God. That covers practically everything in life, doesn't it? not just what I do in a particular circumstance, but how I try and live by the power of the Holy Spirit because of what God has done for me in Christ, making me his child, motivating us and leading us in that direction with the outcomes of our thinking, our actions, and our attitude. One of the great challenges that we have as Christians is the importance of being integrated people. Not people who just do things, but people who think through what we do in a godly, quiet, and disciplined way. We have the opportunity uh, then of building relationships in a deep and a lasting way. Not just because we do things that are good, but because we are being so conformed to be like Christ that we reflect him more and more in how we live in the little things as well as the big things of life. I want to end with something which is really important. I think, and I believe Paul, St. Paul bears this out, that when we live as Christian people, we will be people who give thanks people who are grateful 
time and time and time again. We will live with joy. I'll give a confession before. One of the things that I find really, really, really difficult about Australians, being a pom, <laughs> is that Australians do not sing. <laughs> we do not, you know, I go to church, you know, and they mumble. God, get me, get me into a, get me into a Welsh pub, you know. <laughs> You know, you got four guys standing there and they're harmonizing before you know anything else, you know, and it's just great. Paul, later on in Colossians, you know, reading Colossians, he says, Sing with joyful hearts to the Lord. I've got the, I beefed a bit about that now. Okay, I can get on with it. Being grateful, being thankful should characterize how we live. Time and again, Paul says in Colossians, be thankful, do something with thanksgiving, live with joy. Time and time again, about four times, he actually has it. I came across, oh, I'll, I'll forget it. <laughs> I'll never find it. <laughs> but Christian people are called to be joyful people. And joy and gratitude and thanksgiving should characterize us. I know uh, very well uh, an elderly lady. She is 95 years old. And every time I talk with her, I say, what good thing has happened this week? And she says, oh, I'm so thankful that. She's a Christian lady who lives with gratitude. I knew another uh, elderly lady uh, many, many years ago. And uh, her daughter told me, every time I take my mum upstairs to bed, she's 83 years old, she says to me, and now, pet, I wonder what exciting thing is going to happen tomorrow. <laughs> Living with gratitude, Living with hope is something that we are called to be and to do as Christian people. How then shall we live? We shall live with hope. We shall live with thanksgiving. We will be people who are motivated because Jesus reigns over the whole of creation. We will be empowered by the Holy Spirit living within us to direct us and to guide us and to fill us with who Jesus is. Our life's outcomes will be in our thinking, in our attitude, in our actions, and done with thanksgiving. Stay on course. When I saw in a commentary I was reading on Colossians, those words by um, Bishop Tom Wright, who was the Bishop of Durham, and uh, I've come here on my bike, I cycle everywhere, I loved his comment. Being a Christian is like riding a bike. If you don't go forward, you'll fall off. <laughs> so let me pray for all of us now. Heavenly Father, we thank you that in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you have come to us. You have given us through him the hope of glory. Because in you, in him, all your fullness dwelt. And he revealed your heart of love. He lived that love. He lived your kingdom. He died to save us, to ransom us, to redeem us, to overcome the power of, Israel, of evil. And you raised him from death that we might be people who live for his praise and glory, live as worthy of him. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will speak to our hearts and minds, that you will empower us by your Holy Spirit, and that you will equip us in our thinking, in our attitudes, in our actions, to be people who day by day keep on course and live 
as Jesus would have us live. And so, gracious God, we pray for your blessing, not only upon us now, but upon us throughout this day and during the coming week. Be with us at work. Be with us when it's tough, when we, we have hard decisions to make. Be with us in company of other people where it's sometimes easy just to take the easy way. Help us not to be prickly people, but help us to be people who are motivated by Jesus to be grateful, to be thankful, and to live for your praise and glory. And we ask this in his name. Amen.